It was October 2021. I was two months into my dream postdoc position, and I was straight up not having a good time. I had just been broken up with by two people I really cared about. A postdoc was a lot more isolating than I had anticipated, and there's a pandemic, and my brain had coded fun as selfish pretty firmly. But mostly, I was sort of having an existential crisis about my work. I study grief and trauma, and I use brain imaging to understand why some people experience a severe chronic form of grief. I didn't go to grad school initially intending to study grief. Actually, I just wanted to work with, with the person whose lab I joined. But uh, once I was in it, I was hooked. I would talk to our bereaved participants, and the work I was doing felt important. My dissertation study results actually made sense, and I trusted the data. It felt like I was doing good science, and I was contributing to how we understand prolonged grief. It was so much fun to lose myself in data, even if the only thing I got done that day was troubleshoot one script. I particularly loved talking about ideas with my PhD mentor, Mary Frances. Near the end of my PhD, we were working together on a theory paper where we proposed that grieving is a form of learning, really relearning the world. One of her ideas was about how, why it, the brain has so much difficulty coping with the loss of a loved one. And that has to do with a part of the brain called the hippocampus. This is a part of the brain that's involved in a lot of different memory functions, but one of the things that it does for us is it builds spatial maps. It maps out our physical environment so that we can do things like remember that home exists even if we're not there at that moment, and we know how to get from here to there. Her idea was that Perhaps just as the brain does this for our physical space, it may also do this for our relationships. And what makes grief so difficult to deal with is that suddenly that mental representation, where that person was on the map that we cared about, they're no longer there and we don't know how to find them. So that was a lot of fun. <laughs> 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 but now I am, I moved across the country twice during a pandemic in two years, and I couldn't stop obsessing about my work. The neuroscience work I was doing felt increasingly disconnected from what I was seeing people go through all around me. There was an overwhelming amount of grief and trauma, and I felt completely unable to do anything about it. I couldn't stop thinking, what is this all for? Am I just now wasting my second NIH fellowship's worth of taxpayer dollars to make these silly little brain images that I don't even know if they mean anything? They might not even be real. What the hell am I doing with my life and why is everything terrible right now? So. At that point, my six years of training as a clinical psychologist finally kicked in, <laughs> and I recognized that I could probably benefit from therapy. <laughs> I found a therapist named Olivia, spelled with an A, not an O, and she was a really good therapist. Of all the therapists I've had, which have been many, I probably trusted her the most enough to do the things that I didn't want to do, which in therapy are usually the things that you should be doing. I remember one time we would meet on Mondays. I would be sitting at home on my couch and she would be on my laptop screen in front of a green wall hanging in New York, wherever she was. And I was sitting on the couch, I was crying about missing grad school and, and everyone I knew there, as usual. And I finally had to ball up the wet wad of Kleenex I was holding in my hand, and I looked up at the screen and said, oh my god, I need to get over this. I cannot be like one of those people whose peak of their existence was when they were 
high school football quarterback, and they're 45 and they're still telling stories about that. I cannot be 40 in five years and still talking about my PhD. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, Saren, you study grief, right? Yes. <laughs> it's okay to be sad about everything you lost. Now, I'm someone who usually gets a little prickly when people try to validate me too much, but <laughs> there was something about hearing it from Olivia that really meant something to me. I believed her. When we terminated six months later, she told me that I was the first of her clients to ever show her a painting that I'd done inspired by a therapy exercise. Overall, things felt a lot less terrible, but I was still, still stuck on this issue with my work and the brain imaging. And how do we even know, is any of this real? Am I just particularly skilled at making up stories I am seeing in patterns and statistical noise? What if, what if none of this means anything? About seven months later, it's 1 a.m. and I'm standing in my tiny bathroom brushing my teeth. On Sunday night, I had been working late on some lectures I was supposed to give to the psychiatry residents that week, actually about grief and grief neurobiology. And as I was brushing my teeth with one hand, I was scrolling through Twitter with the other hand, despite knowing that catching up on whatever science Twitter is beefing about this week is not a great way to wind down before you go to sleep. <laughs> and as I scrolled, a post from one of my Twitter mutuals caught my attention. Now, this is someone that I don't actually know them. We had just done the thing where you've added each other at some point on Twitter because you're vaguely in the same field. But what stopped me in my tracks and made my stomach drop was I saw the name Olivia spelled with an A, the name of my therapist. And then I saw the last name of my therapist and a photo and a GoFundMe link for funeral costs. I felt so disoriented. I finally spit out my toothpaste and thought about this, this doesn't feel right. This, this shouldn't be happening. I thought about everything Olivia had helped me with and all of the other people that I'm sure she, she had helped too and all of the people that she would have helped if she hadn't died. She did amazing work, both for her clients in therapy and also for her community as an advocate for people affected by interpersonal violence and trauma. And I finally put down my toothbrush and because my brain is an asshole, the next thought I had was, you should have been the one who died. You don't do shit for anyone. And Olivia had so much more to give to the world. Thank you, brain, that is extremely helpful right now. And then the next thought I had after that was, wow, I cannot believe how disoriented I feel. This is a, it's this very spatial feeling. This is cool. This is what Mary Frances, my PhD advisor, was talking about. <laughs> with the spatial maps and the hippocampus. And I thought, well, maybe if the spatial maps idea is real, then fuck it, maybe what I'm doing could be real too. A few months later, I am sitting in a hotel lobby, a uh, continental breakfast bar with my mom. We've been visiting my sister in DC and I'm telling my mom about the latest grant that I'm writing, all about how our brains learn to adapt to loss. And she starts telling me about her father who died when she was younger than I am now. I've never really heard him or her talk about him before. And I'm watching as, as tears start to roll down her cheeks under her glasses and she asks me, how does our brain know how to do that? 
how does it know to stop looking for that person that we love who's gone? Because I felt it happen, but how and why? And I say, yes, that is exactly what I'm writing this grant about. <laughs> That's exactly the human experience I'm trying to understand. And it felt like that was real. The next day, I am on the train back to New York and nestled into the vinyl seat in my winter coat. I pull up my laptop. I'm supposed to be working on this assistant professor position application, which is really overwhelming, but it, right now it feels actually exciting. I like thinking about what my program of research is gonna be in five years, 10 years. What are the questions that I think are so important for the world to understand, for science to understand, that I can deal with the rest of this stuff. The losing my community, f moving for academic jobs every couple of years, the trying to find someone to pay me money to run the brain scanner, the doubts about whether or not I'm doing the right thing, whether I'm helping anyone. And in that moment, I thought, Thank you, Olivia. I am clearly still learning from you. Thank you.